things they were teaching, blind leading the blind. Let me tell you something. Just because some character writes a book doth a Bible scholar not make. All right? There's only one way you can be a student of God's Word, and that's to know how to study His Word. So I just felt that first opportunity I had, we were going to talk about two of the main deceptions of the end times. And we have a lot of new people that join us all the time, so I just want to talk a little bit first about the so-called rapture theory. Why? It's taught that in the end times, rather than having the gospel armor on in place to do battle against Satan and his children, you're going to fly away. Run like a scared chicken. I know that probably offends some, be that as it may. We want to discuss this. It isn't important what I say about it or what you say about it. Or what anyone else says about it. What's important is what does the Word of God say about it. All right? Don't, don't ever forget that. Most students or teachers or doctors of God's Word in seminaries are taught how to utilize certain commentaries. Now, and that's about as far as they go. Use this good commentary or that good commentary. And all a commentary, commentary is, is usually some man's work a generation or two or three before your time based on the events that were happening at that time. So it's outdated and it's a, it's a man's opinion which throws it into the category of traditions of men. So, beware of commentary teachers. You know, just because you can read a book or, um, or quote some man's commentary doesn't make you a Bible student, all right? <clears throat> Again, a Bible student is one that studies the Word of God and is a student of that book, that word. And basically, I like to call it the manuscripts, all right? Now, <clears throat> a teacher, a true teacher, I'm just going to give you some little clues as to how you can tell whether you're studying under a true teacher with a gift from God or someone else. A true teacher will teach you how to think and study for yourself. A true teacher will recommend to you the tools that you will need. Let's say that if you're only an English speaking person that will have the ability to break say the King James back to the original languages. That's to say Hebrew or Greek. Because it doesn't do any good necessarily. It might help in certain cases. But if you're really studying God's Word, a Webster's Dictionary is not going to help you that much. Because the, Eng the English is translated by men. It is for this reason that we keep uh, copies of the original King James 1611. Because it has within it, even before you get to the scriptures, a letter to you, the reader, by the translators. They, they have a message there. In other words, the translators that translated the good old King James from the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Chaldee, wrote you a letter that they felt was very important. It's quite a lengthy letter to warn you of the very same things I'm warning you of now. To helping you to think. Just stop and think a moment. God's word was given in those languages. And you have to basically go to those languages, especially in the critical points, before you're going to understand. Now secondly, one of the most important things to learn and to think about is to rightly divide the word. What does that mean? Always be aware of who it is written to. The particular book or chapter or verse or whatever the subject and the object, who's being discussed? What time frame was it given in? 
Was this a type of something that would be in the end times? Or is it literal? It, it does not take a great deal of time to be very efficient in growing skilled in those departments. Example, the book of James is written to the tribes scattered abroad. That's to say the tribes of Israel. James teaching having to do with what the tribes obligations and duties would be in the relationship with Jesus Christ. So to be able to rightly divide the word. You know, you know one of the main reasons that I really like all my students to have the companion Bible and yes, it, the Bible, the price of the Bible helps bring us to you on the air, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is that it teaches you how to outline the scriptures. In other words, to make an outline whereby you realize who all the they's and them's and so forth. And what subjects pertain to. It is important if you intend to make an intelligent study of God's Word, and that's the way you're going to build your faith, is to recognize again, it doesn't come from some man, it doesn't come from some commentary. The truth comes from the Word of God, and it's what it says that is important. Now, let's talk about the so-called rapture theory. All right, and you for yourself must decide. This is not done to offend anyone, but to cause you to look for yourself. To, in other words, I suppose we're covering a very basic subject, but I want to show you how to study. Greek and Hebrew are what I call a fixed language. In other words, almost every generation English has many words that take on a total different meaning. Uh, such as bebop and and uh, rap and uh, many other things that and sometimes we even change not bad to good and good to bad. Now, I'm saying in 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 generation is a um, way of expressing themselves. English is not a fixed language, but the Greek is. And as long as you, in your outline or when you're considering a set of verses there's a subject and an object the Greek will not change those subjects and objects on you with the exception of using types and symbolism at times then the subject and object will be the same what you have to understand is what does this particular thing symbolize all right such as in the last verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelation it very clearly tells you these stars are angels so when it speaks of a star, that's symbolic of an angel. All right. So, but watch closely. Now, the rapture theory is basically built upon this closing scriptures of chapter four of First Thessalonians, where Paul is uh, teaching concerning our gathering back to Christ. Let's pick the thought up in the 4th chapter of 1 Thessalonians in the 13th verse. And let's cover it carefully now. Very carefully. The 13th verse reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means those that are dead. Those that have gone on before us. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That means the heathen. I don't want you, Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant as the heathen are concerning where the dead are, those that are asleep. That, my dear friends, is the subject. All right? We're not going to change away from that subject. Greek will not afford that. All right? Now let's go with verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you either believe that or you're not a Christian, if you believe that Christ died, was in the tomb, but came forth from that tomb, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now what is that saying? That if you believe Christ rose, so did their spiritual bodies. 
God could not bring them, Christ could not bring them with him if they were not with him. All right? As it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, to be absent, well, rather, to dust to dust for the flesh body, but the spirit itself goes instantly with the soul to the Father, the spirit being the intellect of the soul. Goes instantly to the Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Now there are some that we know from the Apocrypha and the parable taught by Christ concerning Lazarus and the rich man. And the subject still is where are the dead? Don't be ignorant. That's what Paul stated. Nothing about a rapture. All right? <coughs> Excuse me. And this is very important that you hang on to that subject. Don't, don't let man's teachings interfere with the teachings of God himself. All right? And... We know from that uh, parable of Lazarus and the rich man that there was a gulf between, even in paradise, where some of these souls were in holding for judgment to hell. And I know in the parable of the, it is spoken of as he is in hell. Well, in a way, he is mentally. The lake of fire does not come into being until the last day of the millennium. Verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of God. Now, this is not some man's traditions. It's not some Bible commentary. It is this we say to you by the word of God that we which are alive, that's you, and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not, I repeat, shall not prevent them which are asleep. Why? Don't be ignorant about it. We cannot prevent them because they're already with him. It means we can in no wise perceive them, is what the Greek says, because they're already with him. They're not going to be raised to him. They already have been. All right? So don't, don't let man deceive you. Watch the subject. And watch the object in the Word of God and think for yourself. This is very important. And I will explain why in the closing um, minutes of this lecture. Why it is extremely important that you understand these scriptures and be not ignorant as the heathen are as to where the dead are. They're already with him. We in no ways, it is stated in this verse, can precede them. Why? It's obvious. They're already there. If you believe Christ rose, you better believe they did too, all right? Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, that's the seventh trump, and the voice of the seventh angel mentioned in Revelation, what, about 7.14, and the dead in Christ shall rise first after a colon. All right? Simply recapping the thought, the dead will rise first. Why? Because they're already there. And we which are alive, Paul covers this more in depth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 52. In an instant... At the last trump, and only at the last trump, does the change come. All right? Now listen carefully. It is important that you spend 20 bucks. What is that compared to the price of your soul? And, and or $30, whatever, and pick up a Strong's Concordance. Don't take a substitute. Don't take a Young's. Don't take some other piece of junk. Get a Strong's exhaustive concordance whereby you as an English speaking person can break it back to the languages whereby you can understand what these scriptures say in the Greek. Don't go get a Webster's. That will not help you in this case. What you need to know is what did the original manuscript say in the Greek or Hebrew. Alright? Now, so what did he say there? At the seventh trump, at the shout of, of that uh, seventh angel, 
we that are alive and remain, we're going to see Christ returning to this earth and not until. All right? Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Now this is where the so-called rapture doctrine comes from. This is at the seventh trump, at the last trump, we will be caught up, what? From the flesh, seeing flesh, together with them in the clouds, which simply as clouds as you, Paul spoke colloquial Greek. You might call it street Greek. To him, this meant a large group, like a covey of quail, a cloud of quail. There was a whole cloud of grasshoppers out there, all right? To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And it is true, when the Lord returns, He's here forever. He will be on this earth forever. At the seventh trump, and the seventh trump only, don't let some joker have you to pay strict attention to the subject and the object. Paul saying, are you ignorant as to where the dead are? All he has said is, they're already with Christ. And when he returns, we're going to be changed into and meet him in the air. There's just one big problem with this word air here, and it's important that you have a Strong's Concordance to check it out in the Greek, air. Do you know what it is? It's the breath. Your breath body, ruach in the Hebrew, or pneuma in the uh, Greek meaning your spirit body. In other words, in an instant, you're going to be changed from the flesh into a spiritual body. The breath of life that God breathed into the flesh shall be in its own breath body. That's all it means. That we will be changed exactly as it is written by this same teacher, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, 3 and 4. That instantly we're changed into that incorruptible body. He spends half of the chapter teaching that you should not be ignorant again as to the two bodies of man, the dualism, the flesh body and the spiritual body. Let's continue. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. They should be a comfort to you. The God's elect, as it is written in Mark 13, will stand against the false Messiah. Now, Paul, when he wrote this to the Thessalonians, the entire books, 1 and 2 of Thessalonians, was basically, the subject was the return of Christ. In other words, Paul is making it very clear and he doesn't want you to be ignorant as to where he is, whereby you will know where he returns from and where we will be in relationship to that. The subject is, all those that are asleep, if you believe Christ rose from the dead and they're dead in him, you better believe they're with him, already there. And that when he returns at the seventh trump, as it is written, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we're going to join them right here in the breath of life, the air body, spiritual body, in other words. That's all Paul has said. Now, this caused quite an uproar, and it still does to this day. 